The First World War is synonymous with trench warfare. Long, narrow, muddy and damp ditches carved into the earth, providing shelter to soldiers fighting a war on land. These are the images typically conjured up when we think about this monumental conflict. But as war on the Western Front waged on, other huge battles, just as crucial, were taking place at sea. Dreadnought battleships, submarines, torpedo boats and destroyers all threatened to clash amongst perilous waves, as Britain pushed to maintain its blockade against Germany. And the most important naval action seen during the war was the Battle of Jutland. The date was the 31st of May 1916. Just off the coast of Jutland in Denmark, the largest nautical battle of the First World War was about to take place. The battle, involving 100,000 men and 250 ships, would last close to two days. But who threw the first punch, and did Britain actually win the fight? To understand what the Battle of Jutland was, and how it came about, we first need to go back almost 20 years. Before the start of the First World War, Britain and Germany were in a naval arms race. Britain had, for almost 100 years, maintained complete naval supremacy of the seas, established at Trafalgar in 1805. Germany felt threatened by this. At the same time that Germany was establishing its high seas fleet, masterminded by Secretary of State for the Navy, Vice Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz, Britain was developing the HMS Dreadnought. In 1906, Britain launched this impressive new type of naval ship with 10 guns, steam turbine power and thick armour. The dreadnought had arrived, it levelled the playing field and both sides had to start building their fleets again from scratch. These two 15-inch guns from HMS Ramillies and HMS Resolution are a landmark feature of the Imperial War Museum here in London. Although not fired at Jutland, what they do show is the scale of the ships involved in the battle. The 15-inch Mark I naval gun fired a 1,938-pound shell at a velocity of 2,640 foot a second. To put this into context, this could fire up to a range of over 16 miles. A crew operating a twin 15-inch turret could fire two rounds from each gun every minute. Germany embarked on building their own fleet of dreadnoughts to hit back at the competition and although this surprised the British, they doubled their efforts. This was the start of the naval arms race, a major contributing factor to the war between Britain and Germany in 1914. Britain's strategy was one of blockade. Having plugged the North Sea with the Dover Patrol covering the English Channel and the Grand Fleet at Scapa Flow covering the Orkneys to the Norwegian coast. Germany's high seas fleet was effectively contained in the North Sea. This would, it was believed, limit German surface activity to minor actions and restrict both merchant and surface naval operations worldwide for Germany. Blockade would protect the Allied war effort, prevent the supply of raw materials that our enemies needed for weapons and ammunition, and starve its people into submission. It also allowed Britain to ensure a relatively safe passage for the British Expeditionary Force being sent to France. Germany led a strategy of offensive operations, luring British forces out of port to take out the force piecemeal. In 1914, the German High Seas Fleet carried out North Sea raids on Great Yarmouth, Scarborough and Hartlepool. This drew out British ships into action, resulting in the Battle of Dogger Bank in January 1915. Britain had a secret weapon at its disposal during the First World War, intelligence. At the start of the war, Britain had cut German communication lines, forcing Germany to use British cables to communicate with the outside world. Then, on the 26th of August 1914, the German light cruiser SMS Magdeburg ran aground while scouting at the entrance to the Gulf of Finland. Efforts to refloat the cruiser were fruitless. Then attempts to scuttle her failed. Unfortunately for the Germans, Russian vessels arrived on the scene just as the Magdeburg's crew were trying to escape. Three copies of German codebooks were captured. One was delivered by hand to London. By November, the British had worked out how to decipher German naval messages. The stage was being set for battle. Over the first two years of the war, the German fleet had never lured out the full force of Britain's navy. That was their strategy. The German High Seas Fleet, led by Admiral Reinhard Scheer, had planned to draw out part of the British fleet to weaken its force. 
Scheer's Vice Admiral, Franz Hipper, led this daring mission with his battle cruiser scouting group. Scheer had the plan. He wanted to bring Admiral Sir David Beatty's battle cruiser fleet, based in Rosyth, and Admiral Sir John Jellicoe leading the Grand Fleet into the North Sea. Scheer's plan was to extinguish Beatty's battle cruiser force before Jellicoe's Grand Fleet had time to arrive, with Hipper's force spearheading the mission. It was the crucial decisions of these individuals which led to the Battle of Jutland playing out as it did. At the start, Scheer's plan looked as if it was going to work. It's early evening on the 30th of May 1916. The British Admiralty have intercepted messages revealing the German fleet's plan to set sail the following morning. They order Admirals Beatty and Jellicoe to sea. At 10.30pm, the Grand Fleet, led by Jellicoe, leaves Scarpa Flow, with Beatty following from Rosyth around the same time. Vice Admiral Franz von Hipper's scouting force leaves port, with Admiral Reinhard Scheer leaving an hour later. HMS Galatea notices two German ships, signalling enemy in sight, firing the first shot of the battle at 2.28pm. At this point, Beatty orders a seaplane scouting sortie from HMS Angadine, piloted by Lieutenant Frederick Rutland. This is the first such reconnaissance mission of its kind. Rutland signals to HMS Engadine, spotting five German destroyers and three cruisers. The run to the south begins in an aim to cut Hipper's force off from returning to port. Between 3.40 p.m. and 3.50 p.m., Jellicoe receives a message from BT. I am engaging the enemy. Hipper turns southeast with the aim of leading Beatty into the hands of the High Fleet. Sailing in parallel lines, both sides fire. SMS Lutzu hits HMS Lion's Q-turret. Major Francis Harvey, aboard HMS Lion, suffers a severe injury which would later prove fatal, as he crawls to the voice pipe from his turret to speak to the gun magazine below, ordering the closure of the room doors and it to be flooded with seawater so the explosive material held in the magazine would not ignite. HMS Indefatigable receives a direct fire from SMS von der Tan. She explodes and sinks. Over 1,000 men lose their lives. HMS Queen Mary receives a direct hit, exploding its magazine, killing over 1,200 crew. HMS Princess Royal, hidden behind the smoke and spray of the waves, is reported to be lost. However, it's only compromised of view. In response to this news, BT reportedly exclaims, There seems to be something wrong with our bloody ships today. Commodore William Goodenough's cruiser squadron at the southern edge of BT's force sights Shear's high seas fleet. BT starts the run to the north in an aim to draw the German fleet into the hands of Jellicoe's Grand Fleet. The Germans follow BT's forces. HMS Chester is ordered to investigate gun flashes. Four German light cruisers open fire on the ship. Almost all guns are put out of action in the crossfire, including this very gun behind me. This five and a half inch gun was once installed on HMS Chester. It is this gun which Jack Cornwall mans during the Battle of Jutland. As HMS Chester is hit 17 times, the scene aboard the ship becomes one of utter destruction. Crew lay dead with debris strewn across the ship. The entirety of Cornwell's fellow team are dead, and he himself is hit in the stomach and legs. Cornwall, despite of his injuries, remains at his post and fulfills his duty. After the battle, HMS Chester returns to port in the River Humber, and injured persons are taken to hospital in Grimsby, where on the 2nd of June, Cornwall dies from his injuries. He was just 16 years old. Jack Cornwell was awarded this Victoria Cross for his actions at Jutland and became the youngest recipient of the honour. His funeral was a quiet one, without the formality of ceremony, but after his story was recounted in the press, it began to catch the public imagination. This turned a boy from Essex into a memorialised icon of the First World War. His portrait was commissioned for the Admiralty, his image adorned stamps, and he even had a scout badge named after him. At the same time as HMS Chester received its 17 direct hits, HMS Shark is also hit. Only six of its crew will survive the attack. Jellicoe and Beatty's forces unite. The German fleet emerges from the mist to find the entire British fleet ahead of them. 
the Grand Fleet completes a maneuver called Crossing the T, which moves a substantial proportion of the fleet across the approaching enemy force, creating a T-shape, giving the British a strong advantage as all its ships have the potential of firing on the enemy. This means the German fleet's leading ships can only use their forward-facing guns. Jellicoe's ships form into six parallel lines of four ships. HMS Invincible engages SMS Derflinger and is hit, splitting in half, killing over 1,000 crew members. Scheer fears the destruction of his fleet. He orders the High Seas fleet to turn and sail in the opposite direction. The High Seas fleet turns east in the direction of the Grand Fleet. Jellicoe crosses the T for a second time. German ships charge at the British fleet turning to launch a torpedo attack for cover. Jellicoe turns to avoid the torpedo launch. This puts the Germans out of range, and at 7.45 p.m. Scheer turns south. Darkness begins to fall. Final shots are fired between both forces' battle cruisers. Jellicoe orders the fleet into a night cruising formation, with the signal, no night intentions ordered. Scheer takes the shortest route to home, and the Grand Fleet follows, with both British and German fleets crossing paths and short bursts of action occur for the next six hours. Next, HMS Southampton sings SMS Fraunlo. Jellicoe is unaware of the presence of German battleships when the fourth destroyer flotilla at the rear of the fleet engages in night action with German light cruisers and dreadnoughts. HMS Tipperary is hit. HMS Black Prince is separated from its squadron and is sunk. All 900 crew are lost. Between 1 and 2 a.m., SMS Lutzul is scuttled after sustaining heavy damage. Between 2 and 2.15 a.m., the last action between British destroyers and German battleships and cruisers finally occurs. SMS Pomern is sunk, losing all its crew. The British fleet reforms into day cruising, with light cruisers joining formation at 6 a.m. Beatty communicates to Jellicoe that HMS Queen Mary and HMS Indefatigable have been lost, 17 hours after they sank. The Grand Fleet turns towards Scapa Flow. The fight is essentially over. The Battle of Jutland saw periods of intense action and moments of relative inaction. But who, in the end, won? Many historians have debated this question again and again because the answer is not so clear-cut. 6,000 British and 2,500 German servicemen were lost during the conflict. Britain lost 14 ships, Germany 11. After the battle, each side would claim victory. Although British losses were greater than that of Germany, Jellicoe and the Grand Fleet had done enough to maintain naval superiority. A large operation against the British fleet was always going to be a challenge and the scale of Jutland was not seen again during the First World War. The Battle of Jutland may have helped to bring the war to an end. Because Britain had maintained its control above sea level, the Germans turned to unrestricted submarine warfare in an attempt to starve Britain out of the war. America condemned the targeting of merchant ships, and this threatened to bring them into the conflict. So, in January 1917, a German civil servant, Arthur Zimmermann, dispatched a now infamous coded message to the German ambassador of Mexico, proposing an alliance against America. Unfortunately for the Germans, Britain had been intercepting their messages. They were able to decode and share the message with America. This gave President Woodrow Wilson the impetus and political cover to bring America and their troops into the war, to crush German morale and to help Britain bring the fighting to a close. The outcome of the Battle of Jutland may have been ambiguous, but what is clear is that thousands sacrificed their lives in a crucial battle that influenced the course of the war and left its mark on history.